Well, it is once again my great pleasure to introduce you to Brian. Peter Brian is uh, doing a resident lecture series with us here. Uh, it started uh, last week and is continuing on after break. Uh, and will go until early or uh, early mid April. Um, a couple of logistical things before I uh, continue. Um, so if you are here for CES credit, the flight in is Maria over in the corner over here, and so you can swipe in make sure you do that uh, sometime while you're here. If you're here for a biology course, I recommend you sign in on this little sheet, and I will communicate this to your instructor. Uh, instructor for your if you are allowed. Um, let's see. I guess without uh, any other further ado, uh, Dr. Ryan is an alumnus from St. Francis University. He graduated uh, some time ago. I think the date, sorry, didn't mean to say it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> No, that's the whole series. Yeah. The, soci the, the, the title is that one. Domestication and Civilization. Oh, well, anyway, thank you, Professor Mary. I wanted to start here, for those of you who missed all the first three lectures, and just say that this is a, a, a series of courses, lectures about science and society. It's not the traditional, this is my research lecture, but rather it's a, a lecture of stories about how science has been applied, <coughs> particularly genetic science, to important questions. <coughs> and they're ones that I've been tangentially involved in through my students and postdocs, and they all have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, the basic overview of the course is there's eight lectures which I deliver. The first one was on human origins and migration. The second was on using genetics to understand the history not only of humans but of the species we share the planet with. Last week or the other Tuesday, I talked about applying genetic technologies to a field where it wasn't applied when I was a student at St. Francis, which is conservation and how it, genomics and genetics and science has become agenda items at management workshops for saving many of our endangered species. It's not something everybody cares about, but there's a lot of people who do, and those people really appreciate the science. Today we're going to talk about domestication, an interesting ev event which I tend to think involved our first geneticists who rounded up plants and animals and said, let's see what we can do. Uh, there are four other lectures coming after the break. There's one on plagues. There's one on discovering uh, <coughs> clues for developing medical uh, drugs and approaches to incurable diseases. There's a lecture about uh, how uh, uh, gene studies actually have played a role in uh, um, <clears throat> helping out in bad diseases. And then there's a, a fun one about how genetics and DNA particularly has become accepted and really become a principal part of capital crime uh, prosecution. Um, <clears throat> so there's also going to be some visiting lectures uh, by from one of my friends. Lori Goodman is the editor of a uh, <clears throat> genetics or genomics journal called GigaScience, which is hosted in Hong Kong, but she happens to be in the country and she's coming in um, the week after the break. Dave Wilt is the director of the Conservation Center at the National Zoo. He's been a kind of a friend and a collaborator of mine, but his specialty is reproduction, so he's going to talk about giant pandas and he's going to talk about black footed ferrets. Um, Anne Schmidt Kunzel is, was one of my students about eight or nine years ago. She's now the director of genetics and genomics and genetic ecology at the Cheetah Conservation Fund in a country called Namibia in southern Africa, which is several hundred thousand hectares of, of land dedicated to cheetah conservation, of which she has become a leader. John Gearhart uh, is an old friend. He is 
best known for being the discoverer of human stem cells. He's a professor at Penn, an endowed chair, and he's agreed to get in his car and drive out to Loretto and give us a talk. Okay, <laughs> which I said, well, good for you, John. So this is, these will all be fun. Uh, anyhow, today I'm going to talk to you about an interesting series of events that people have wondered about for a long time, and that is the timing of the original domestication. As you all know, there's only a handful of domesticated animals that are <coughs> uh, considered tame enough to work with us, and domestication is really the process of developing a useful organism, either a plant or an animal, that has a way of turning it into something useful. And about 20,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, before the last ice age retracted, humankind themselves probably weren't very domesticated. They were hunter-gatherers and wandering around in, in, in Africa and in Europe in different spots. But soon thereafter, there was a a uh, Neolithic revolution where hunter-gatherers settled down into small villages, began to cooperate with each other, and more importantly, they developed the ability to capture uh, the benefits of some of the plants and some of the animals that they were used to hunting or running between. And this is the story about the timing, the place, and our intuition about how it all happened that I'll talk about today. I'll concentrate actually on things that we don't eat much. One are dogs and the other is cats. But these have become companion animals, which have done something very unusual compared to their predecessors. They've gotten along with us, they sit in our laps, they become members of the family, and they often become very treasured individuals. The cat, for example, has numbered in the, in the, in the area between 600 million and a billion individuals, including feral cats, which run around many of the cities throughout the world, and the domestic cat breeds that we know about today. First, let's talk a little bit about dogs. We know that there's a lot of breeds of, of dogs, several hundred. Most of them are different in size and appearance, and we all know that they have done that through artificial selection, which is humans organizing their breeding. We also know that uh, they uh, have a lot of genetic diversity, maybe more than their parent species, the wolves, in the sense that they come in small pecanese or tiny little dogs to the Great Danes and the Newfoundlands, which weigh uh, over 100 pounds. Why is all that variation present in the dogs? Why is it not present in cats? These are questions that were asked to me when some of my students, like Robert Wayne, came to the laboratory 30 or 40 years ago. He still hasn't answered that completely, but he's made a good, I think, try. Now, <clears throat> dogs are treasured, and there's many of them. And there's a lot of them. There's not, they're not quite as numerous as cats, but the interesting thing is I have a reputation of working on cats. My student Robert Wayne had a reputation of working on dogs, and I have dogs, pets, and he has cats. I don't know why that is. But the point I'm trying to make is that domestication is mysterious because it took place during the time of prehistory. And although uh, we know a lot about them, there are many, like one-third of the mammal species of the world are considered either danger or threatened, but no domestic animal has ever gone extinct so far. And these consist of, consist of horses and camels and pigs and goats and lots of species. And based upon just the fossil record, that is, when do we first see some of these recognizable diagnostic domestic species, it looks like the dog was probably the earliest one to be associated with humans. But it was after 10,000 years ago when people first settled down to farming and to villages in the Near East, which is the Middle East around Israel and Saudi Arabia and some of those places, that we saw cows and sheep and goats and pigs and yaks and other species become domesticated. Later, some of the other species became domesticated as well, but there's still only 20 or 30 of these species that are truly domesticated. And it's very clear that not all species can become domesticated because although you can tame a cheetah or a lion or a, or a chimpanzee, that doesn't transmit to its offspring. But a domesticated animal is the conscious breeding, selecting for traits and getting things that basically get along with us. 
Now, this is a difficult slide, but it's a list of some of all the species that have been domesticated. And the only thing I really want to point out is that the dog is probably the oldest. It has been estimated everywhere from 5,000 years ago to 130,000 years ago. Uh, and so part of what I'm going to mention here is how those calculations are made. The fossil record has been a pretty good one, probably one of the oldest fossils that shows the presence of a human and a dog together, indicating a burial of family members, is about 30,000 years ago, old in uh, Siberia. But there's ones in Israel that are younger, 11 or 12,000 years ago, which we thought were important too. In fact, if you make a map of all the fossil finds and so forth that have been, been studied uh, among the dog, uh, looking for dog origins, <clears throat> and as I say the next five or ten minutes, let me mention that the field of trying to figure out where the dogs came from and what the time was is a big field. There's a lot of people studying it right now, and there's papers coming out all the time. And because our laboratory became well known in cats, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, I inevitably get for review the papers that come into science and nature and some of those and have to make a decision as to whether I like it or not. Well, of course, I usually do like it, but sometimes I don't like it. Okay, but let me, sh let me tell you what I mean. Okay, basically, key archaeological sites for dogs. The red ones actually are. Um, uh, a key sites where they're buried with humans. That is, there are uh, indications of uh, going, uh, uh, walking together. There was one site where they found an eight-year-old, uh, footprints of an eight-year-old child. I wasn't sure whether it was a boy or a girl. Right next to it were some dog prints going along with it. So those footprints indicated this eight-year-old kid was taking a walk with a wolf or a dog or something. This is the kind of stuff the archaeologists tell us. And they present it as scientific evidence of the date of it. So there's plenty of dates that go around, and it's been across the world. So where did it start? Was it a single origin? It did it happen in multiple places? Actually, how did it all work? How did they get uh, to know us, and what was their use? Well, well dogs, everybody kind of considers that they have several values. We probably think that the early hunter-gatherers, which were interacting with dogs at least 15,000, if not 30,000 years ago, probably brought them into their camps before people ourselves were domesticated because they performed a good sentry. That is, they would protect them from the, other, from the bears and the other things. Even the Neanderthals, some people speculate, had dogs, although there's no evidence for that. It's just something they write when they write a book, okay? So, because Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years ago. Now, having said that, the evidence that we have shows that the dogs are valued centuries, but they're also good herders that would protect the herds from, from marauding cats and things like that. They would also hunt and, and, and do important things. So there's a lot of reasons why people would have put up with them as long as they behave themselves, unlike wolves, which don't. Okay, so. The next thing is that uh, there are lots of different breeds of dogs. These are the characters that actually uh, started uh, the studies. This is Robert Wayne, who was my student in the 80s, early 80s. This is Elaine Ostrander, she was my colleague at NIH, who runs a cancer lab, but one of her, her passions is this. Carlos Bustamante, he was a student at Harvard, and he's now a professor at Stanford, and he's been involved in a lot of mathematical. Peter Savalin, he's from Sweden. Uh, Chustin lindblad who was at the Broad Institute at MIT, and now she's also in Sweden at Uppsala. And all of them have produced important, learned treatises about population genetics, phylogeny, and other things, trying to understand the background of these dogs. And I seem to have, oh, sorry about this. Let me show you this one first. First of all, we know there's a lot of breeds. And the breeds uh, have been around for a few hundred years. Uh, and they have different characteristics and they've been selected uh, and so forth. But we're not 100% sure what they were selecting for other than appearance and, and certain characters which were good. Now, these guys here started by sampling lots of dogs with 
certain kinds of mitochondrial DNAs or microsatellites or other kinds of tools that molecular evolution has used. And they came up with evolutionary trees which demonstrated that, you know, they probably, these dogs over here, including the primitive ones like the dingo and the boxer and some of these, well, they came from a ancestor of certain wolves and jackals that live out there today. Now, jackals are not in, even in the genus Canis. They are a different kind of canid that diverged, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. But the wolves, they're pretty close. And most observers agree that the dogs probably descended from a wolf-like ancestor. And for a long time, they were saying they defended a wolf, but then there was some studies that said, well, it didn't defend from the modern wolf, it defended from an ancient wolf. Because there were other kinds of studies that would show work on ancient DNA as well. And they demonstrated that, yeah, all these different wolves were going together uh, and, and, and coming out, but there wasn't really a lot of resolution between it. In fact, I'm just going to tell you right now that I could spend two hours talking about the um, <clears throat> evolution and the background of the dog. And I could prevent you many learned treatises. But the first one was in like 1987 when Robert Wayne and his graduate students published a paper with it, a phylogenetic tree. And they said, yeah, it comes from something like a wolf, all these dogs. But the origin, and they did a calculation, was 137,000 years old. That is, that's how old the diversity would be if you use a traditional genetic calculation. I got this paper to review. I called Robert up. I said, you don't believe that. I says, there's not a fossil older than 15,000 years. He says, this is what the data are. I says, yeah, I don't care what the data are. I says, you got to square it with what's going on. He ignored me, published it. And of course, later on, he changed his mind. And now that everybody does agree that it was about 15 or 20,000 years ago. He placed the dogs in the center as origin in the center of Eurasia. And let's go to back to the map, and I'll tell you the story a little bit. In the center of Eurasia. Then Peter Svalen came along in the 90s, and he did a study of 1,500 dogs from across their range and decided that he saw no phylogenetic structure at all. But he saw more diversity in China than any place else, sort of the way we saw more diversity in humans than in anybody else when the out-of-Africa hypothesis came along. So Robert talks to a newspaper man and he says, you know, that's stupid. He says, because that's like going and saying, if you look at America, there's more diversity than there is in Africa, so humans must have started in Africa. There's other things you have to consider too. Then there was another study that looked at something called haplotypes and village dogs, which were collected in Africa. And that, that came out with a Middle Eastern origin about 18,000 years ago. And then another one led by um, uh, Yaping Zhang, who was a student of Ali Riders uh, from uh, China. He basically said, well, we looked at all the dogs in our collection. We have a lot of Chinese dogs, and we get more diversity, and that's the root of the tree, so they must have come from China. The reason that I'm giving you these generalizations and conclusions in the last two minutes is because I'm convinced there is no signal in these dogs about their background. And the reason is that it's too old and there's been a lot of inbreeding since and any phylogenetic signal which was associated with a local region just is so weak that nobody believes it. At least your enemies don't believe it. And that's a difficult thing to say. It doesn't mean that they aren't getting close with the archaeological data and the genetic data. It just means that the precision of the specific place is more difficult. So one of the papers that, was, that claimed it was a haplotype analysis of bunches of SNPs from whole genome sequence, which came out a few years ago. It was Robert Wayne, Bridget von Holt from Princeton, Carlos Bustamante. Um, and they produce trees, which conclude most of the dogs and the different breeds. And they were able to show some weak population phylogenetic structure. But there's no statistics on these things, as you can see. So most of them we don't even believe at all. The one thing that did happen is that wolves did come out as an outgroup, and then some of the so-called uh, uh, 
ancient breeds are listed right here. So they know what the ancient breeds are. And over here, you get the same idea. The different ancient breeds are clustering together. But for those people who are used to looking at phylogenies, you'll see that the differentiation that's going on here is almost undiscernible. You can't, there's no long limbs coming out, which means that trying to sort them out is guesswork. And it's based upon statistical hiccups. So this goes on into these guys. Where there was one thing, one group of, of workers who decided that they had to look at ancient dogs, fossil dogs, and they did, and they didn't do any better. All they were able to conclude was that modern dogs do not represent the wolves. Modern wolves are not the ancient ancestor. It was an ancient wolf that went extinct a while ago. So, and then as I said, there were papers about Asian origins that came out with different kinds of coalescence calculations and other kinds of trees, but the signals were all kind of crappy. So there you are. This is the dog that we finally did the whole genome sequence for the first time at MIT. It was belonged to Eric Lander, who was the head of the Human Genome Project, and he decided because we needed to have a number of species sequenced at high coverage, his dog ought to be one of them. And it was. And it changed the way people thought about dog genetics because all of a sudden, all the veterinary clinical diseases which we had described by talented veterinarians at the, vet, at the 40 or so veterinary schools in our country and the 20 or so outside our country became accessible for genetic identification of the genes and for tracking some of the diseases which were common in the different breeds. Suffice it to say that the dog community has produced a model organism that is used in medical models and at NIH and at other places that is specifically much more powerful than anything we could have done before, in spite of the fact that they couldn't figure out exactly where the dog domesticated started. Cats were done a little slower. I'll tell you that story now. There's only about 40 breeds of cats, but they're quite lovely. And they haven't been around very long. In fact, the first cat show was at the Crystal Palace in London back in around 1890. And before that, cats were not differentiated into breeds. They were just these tabbies. And most people thought, oh, this I want to mention. The cats descend from a phylogeny that I talked about the other day, from a 10 million year old ancestor that lived in Asia. And along these lines, you have the great cats, the cheetahs, the lions, but in, along here, over here, is a group of cats that live in the Mediterranean, which is called the small genus Felis. And I'll talk about those in a second. But that's the group that most people thought the house cats come from. One thing I will mention is that the cat tree that's illustrated here has a bunch of lineages that went extinct. These are the saber-toothed cats that lived across the years, and many of them went extinct as recently as 10,000 years ago. If you go out to Los Angeles at the Rancho La Brea Tar Pits, and you start looking at all the fossils that went away in the late Pleistocene, one of the most common is a series of saber-toothed cats that are no longer here, along with the mastodons and the mammoths. So the, the cat family, which we showed, consists of about 37 different species, was diverged in a hierarchical mantle, which the phylog molecular phylogeny proved. But the small genus Felis is thought to be the parent of the domestic cat. And the domestic cat lineage, or the small genus Felis, consists of cats that have different names. If most of you go to a zoo, Professor Mary told me when I asked him if he'd been to Africa, he says, well, I went to Pittsburgh Zoo once. Okay, <laughs> so if you go to a zoo, you don't see these cats. You see a lion and a tiger and a snow leopard and a clouded leopard and an ocelot and a puma and a cheetah. But these little guys are real cat species that live in different places, like the sand cat lives in the Middle East, the Chinese mountain cat in, the, in, the, in Tibet and other places like that. Black-footed cat is from Southern Africa. And the uh, wild cats exist all throughout um, America, uh, excuse me, throughout Europe and Africa. Now, wild cat is a general term for a species called Felis, subspecies called Felis sylvestris, or species rather. And it's sometimes cut into two, Libica, 
but basically they're all pretty much interbreeding living on two different continents. Now if you look at a cat, and I'll tell you about cats, but I first want to tell you what Mark Twain said. He liked them. He says, when a man loves cats, I'm his friend and comrade without further introduction. So up until the molecular guys got involved in this, most people thought that cat domestication started with the Egyptians. Why? Well, there's a lot of dead cats in the mummies, and there's a lot of mummified cats. In fact, there was a, 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 a excavation near Cairo in, in the 60s where they dug up three or 400 mummified cats, put them in trucks, and sold them for some I don't know what. You see these in the British Museum, you see them in other places as well, these cats. Cats were raised to the order of a deity in, uh, in Egypt, where there was a cat called Bastet, who was kind of like in charge of everything. It was against the rules to do anything to cats other than to feed them. You couldn't, you couldn't harass them, you couldn't beat them, you couldn't sell them, you couldn't even transport them or ship them out of the country. It was against the law. Of course, nobody paid any attention to that because they were always showing up on these ships. But that ancient Egyptian date was around 3,600 years ago, a couple thousand years before the time of Christ, 1,500. So where the cats? Same question we have with the dogs. Well, it was solved mostly by a graduate student who stayed with me for, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 years. He was very expensive. But he did, he did basically spend a lot of time collecting cats from across their range and published some nice papers. And he knew that the European uh, wildcat had a subspecies called Sylvestris, that the African uh, uh, in, Middle East, in, the, in the Middle East was called Libica, and the Asiatic was called Ornata, and the Chinese. So he went over there and he went to all these different countries and to museums, and he collected an materials from interesting specimens. And altogether, he came up with, in addition to about 700 domestic cats, about nearly 1,000 individual specimens. Took him 10 years to do it, he had a good time. And he went to all these places and collected them with his buddies and with his friends and spending my money. So what happened then was we had all of these uh, specimens from throughout these places. And he then began to look at them using the tools of molecular evolution available then. This is seven or eight years ago or 10 years ago. And the first one was mitochondrial DNA phylogeny, which we knew to how to interpret. If you came to my second talk, you saw how that was helpful. We had a lot of characters, a lot of DNA characters in coding genes. And then there were nuclear loci, which are stutter repeats of which there's a few hundred thousand of them in humans and in the cat genome, and 36 of them were mappable, separated on different chromosomes so that they were, they were uh, useful for independent assessment of time and change in a lineage. And this is a difficult slide. I apologize for it. But it presents the results of one of those aspects. This is the mitochondrial DNA markers. Again, there were a couple thousand informative markers. What's important is the phylogenetic or the evolutionary tree algorithms was able to come up with distinctions that were statistically significant among these cats that are illustrated by the color. The outgroup, which is a species that's not even related to it, or a distant related species was the sand cat 230 million years ago, 30,000 years ago, excuse me. Then comes some of the cats that were around. The first one was the Chinese desert cat. The next one, all the green ones are European wildcats. The next one, all the blue ones are from Africa, from a subspecies called Caffra. All the purple ones are from Central Asia. So we've got China, Europe, South Africa, and Central Asia. And then these orange ones, these are all the house cats but there's also the purple ones, which came from the Middle East, which are ingrained in there. In addition to that, I got to mention one. Okay, one thing. When we first started doing this, and I explained to my colleagues what an exciting opportunity we had here, and we were going to do this, they would say, O'Brien, oh, 
you're not going to find anything. And I'll tell you why. This is what scientists do. He says, everybody knows these wildcats live outside of human communities and they're always breeding with the house cats. So they're all mixed up and you're just not going to see any signal. It's going to be worse than the dogs because we know they're interbreeding today. Carlos said, nope, I believe there's going to be a signal. Let's look for it. Well, we clearly saw it. But what I should mention is there were purple guys from Central Asia that is different from, from uh, the Near East that were nested in here. There were also some of these guys nested in here and some of these guys. Let me explain what I mean. If you look at the places where we collected, let's just take Europe. Every population had a mixture of two kinds of cats. The green ones were the authentic European historic wildcat signature group. And the brown ones, well, those were the house cats that were interbreeding with them, but they were different. You could tell them apart. If you looked at Africa, the same thing, full African. So Carlos had a signal with his mitochondrial, even though there were mixtures in there. Same, but he didn't find any differences between the house cats and the ones in the Far East, the Middle East. Also in Asia, same idea. These were Bieti, these are the Chinese cats, they were right. If we looked at the microsatellites, the exact same result. Each one of these individual lines is a composite genotype of 36 markers that were compared to each other in the 1,000 cats. And what we simply saw was that all Europeans had as a closest relative another Europeans. The same with the South Africans, the same with the Central Asians, and the same with the Chinese desert cats. But all the domestic cats in the Middle Eastern, the Near Eastern, well, they were all stuck in this one group. So we had two separate nuclear components that were supporting it. When we looked at the same data using a different algorithm which colors different individual, which colors individuals as whether they fit into these separated populations in this algorithm, what we found was the same thing. It's called structure and it's used a lot. The wild cats were all here, the domestic cats, well, they parsed a little bit better, but not much. So, what did that mean? Well, what it meant to us is the domestic cats, whether we found them in Europe or in America or in Japan or in China or in South America, they all looked like this Near Eastern group right here. So, to me, that simply meant that they're probably closely related to those as if domestication started in that spot. This was a signal the dogs didn't have, but the cats did. Well, when was it? Well, when we did these calculations, we had the same problem that Robert had when he did the calculations of how old were they. When we took the oldest date between the Chinese desert cat, it was 230,000 years. Oh, and I could have written in the paper, we could have said, well, these cats have been around and they've been domesticated for 230,000 years, but that's not what that meant. What it meant was that within the diversity that was present in today's cats, the coalescence state for all that diversity, which was present in the founder population, went back 230 years. That doesn't mean they were domesticated, it just means that's the variation we were sampling. So, I felt better about that. So what was the date? Well, the dates we were coming up with were still kind of old. So molecular clock wasn't quite precise enough to come up with the answer. Well, mercifully, there was some paleontologists at the Museum of Natural History in Paris, led by Jean-Denis Vigny, who, who unearthed a fossil specimen in, in uh, Cyprus, which is an island off of Italy. And it was, a, it was, a, it was an adult uh, individual buried with a cat right next to it. <coughs> and that kind of evidence is what people use in the domestication discussions as evidence for domestication was going on because they were together. And it was estimated not at 3,600, but at 9,500 years ago. And <coughs> this, is the, this is just a cartoon of it. They, and, and they're inches away in human burial that contained other human artifacts that were there. So, we had a place, the Near East, we had a time, 9,500 years ago. So what was going on 9,500 years ago? 
Well, this was 4,000 years or 5,000 years before Egypt. Uh, so what was going on 5,000 years ago was that humans were settling down to villages in the Neolithic age where they'd been hunter-gatherers all this time and exactly the same time that humans settled down and started domesticating species, it looks like the cat domestication really began. There were other dates that are important. In Israel, there were some fossils of cats and humans together, and then years later, in Germany, Greece, Egypt, and so forth, and then they got to the Americas 500 years ago, and Australia 400 years ago, probably from European settlers. Okay, so by and by, there was a five-way radiation of Felis sylvestris, that is the, Europe, the wild cat, into the European, the African, the Central Asian, the East Asian, and the Near Eastern. But it was this one, the Near Eastern, that was identical to house cats found across the world. <clears throat> so the domestic cats and Near Eastern cats fell, fall into one group originating and living in the Near East. Now, <coughs> 12 of the cats Carlos collected were found out in the desert in Saudi Arabia and in Israel hundreds of miles from settlements. And he argued that that convinced him that maybe some of them might be uncompromised, not hybridized, not somehow contaminated with house cats. He was guessing, but that's what he said, okay? I don't know exactly whether they were, but that's important because when you're sampling these things and then you're saying they're closer to domestic cats, well, you gotta be sure your sample is authentic. Okay, so. Cats were first domesticated around 10,000 years when the Neolithic farmers were settling down. And they were settling down and starting to do things that they never did before, which is they were starting to live in families, they stayed in one place, they began to cage up animals, they began to start experimenting with the, with, with the plants. And it basically started in an area where the, where the, the, the fauna uh, was very, very dense, full of different kinds of things. But by uh, working together and living in these small regions, they began to take advantage. They were looking forward to planting things that someday might look like this, which would feed the world. Now, domestication, when it started, had about 10 million people in Northern Europe. Today, we have 6 billion people. That's a 600 times expansion. It was because of their settling down and the agricultural revolution that allowed them to feed that allowed these expansions to take place. So these people, first of all, began, and it's well documented that they, they um, <coughs> domesticated wheats and they domesticated uh, uh, other species such as sheep, pigs, cattle, and goats in exactly the region that we have pinpointed the cows came, that the, the cats was domesticated. Now, why was that? Well, we know that some of the animals that they domesticated had functions. Horses they rode on, cattle uh, could pull things, we could eat, they were foodstuffs. Most of the original domestications were foodstuffs. And there were other, other advantages. But to be kind of honest, cats don't have any real use. They're kind of useless. They don't take instructions. They don't tell you what to, do, what to do. But here they are, living in our living rooms. So how did all that take place? Well, what we think now, and this is a guess, but it's basically becoming very commonly praised, is that cats saw these villages, the wild cats living in, and wild cats have one phenotype domestic cats don't have, which is if they see you or your baby, they will hand you your rear end. But the domestic cats don't do that. They're, they're tame, they're friendly, they get along with you. And there was a selection for that. So what we think is that the cats did what the same thing this did. This is a mouse called Mus Musculus domesticus. It originated from a feral mouse called Mer Mus Musculus, which is a wild mice, which is very good at hunting and caring. These guys are lousy at hunting, and they're well-defined. They are what we call house mice, 
and they began their domesticated period 10,000 years ago by moving into the dumps and under houses and the garbage areas of these early settlements. We think the cats had the same idea. They were attracted to this, and yet the wild cats living in the neighborhood couldn't get away with it because they were nasty. So the animals that basically were a little bit nicer, well, they'd be tolerated a little bit. They might even dispatch some of the mice. And so what finally happened was that all of a sudden, these cats became part of the societies. They were attracted originally by the trash tips around these villages. But as the villages got growing up, they would basically have these cats coming in. They might have had semi-function of dispatching some of the rodents from the grain that they were storing over the winter. But by and large, the, the, what was going on is the cats had decided to domesticate themselves. They weren't being bred together because you can't get a bunch of cats to mate with who you want to if you don't have screens on your doors or you have open windows and they run in and out, just like cats do today. They run out into the countryside and they grab a few birds and then they come back. This is what pet cats do. Well, they did it then too. So they weren't being domesticated in the sense that they were being bred. They were just bas basically being friendly because it was good for them. And that good for them might have been an adaptive character associated which was present in polymorphic in the wildcats, where the wildcats had aggressive suites of genes that helped them survive and live, and the others, well, they got other alleles or combinations of gene variants that allowed them to be friendly. Wouldn't have been too good if they were living out in the middle of nowhere, but living in these villages, it kind of worked. So, one of the interesting theories of evolution that has been around for a long time, was coined originally by a Harvard evolutionary biologist named Ertz Meyer. And he said that most speciation takes pace, place by something he called allopatric speciation. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a population and then the population continues to interbreed and grow of something. And then what happens is a river comes between, or a mountain grows up and separates the two. So the derivative population evolves, and eventually, over time, through separation, they develop reproductive adaptations and breeding structure differences, and they just sort of change around gradually. And that gradual change leads you to a, st a stage where eventually they achieve what's called reproductive isolation, which is that if the river dries up and they connect, they don't like each other anymore and they're not fertile, they're infertile. This is why species are defined as reproductively isolated groups that look similar but they don't exchange genes successfully. Alternative to allopatric speciation is something that Ernst Speyer thought never happened and that was called sympatric speciation where somehow <coughs> population decides in a large growing population, some of them decide, well, we're going to change. We don't care that we're, these other guys are still around. We're just going to continue to evolve in a way that is good for us. This is thought to have happened in the cichlid fish in Lake Victoria, and there's some good evidence that it did. We don't know what separated them or what reinforced the differences. But in this case, if the cats actually become, these domestic cats, a real species, and there's some argument as to whether they're a real species because they do interbreed with the wild forebears. But if they do, it's an example of sympatric speciation because they evolved in with an opportunity to interbreed with the wild cats. But the wild cats and the domestic cats kind of kept away from each other because they liked living in the villages and they liked eating the, eating the, the dumps. So it's kind of an interesting exercise that we have watched about domestication. Domestic cats, like humans and like dogs, have a lot of diseases. And talented veterinary clinicians have identified about 500 human hereditary diseases that have 
analogs or similar things in dogs. And there's about 300 in cats. And this is a list of them as of about eight years ago when we were lobbying for a whole genome sequence of the cat. Things like spinal muscular atrophy, things like diabetes mellitus, things like that one, I don't know, see, moved, there's a couple that moved. Okay, but there, there's amyloidosis and cataracts and cleft palates and colobomas and cryptorchidism and, and all of these things that are listed, listed along this line, polydactyl, hemophilia, and lots of human diseases, 250 altogether. And there's basically a, 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 a database called uh, the Online uh, Mendelian Hermits and Animals, which comes from uh, Australia. But the point is, these diseases are all there. So it was a good idea, if we diabetes and renal dysplasia, so it was a good idea to get genetic empowerment in the cats like was going on in the dogs. There was another reason that made the cats a little more interesting than the dogs, is they have a lot of viruses, a handful of viruses, which are pathological and cause diseases which are similar to human viruses that the dogs don't have. One is a feline leukemia virus, which carries around uh, oncogenes and the capability of inducing infectious leukemia in domestic cats. The second is feline sarcoma virus, which carries oncogenes explicitly. In fact, all of you who know about the oncogenes that get expressed in human tumors that are targets of some of the new smart therapy, many of them, over a third of them, were originally discovered in the feline sarcoma viruses in these cats. And I was there at the time at NIH when they were doing it. It was an exciting time because we never thought anybody cared about these cats, but these sarcoma viruses did help a lot. Then it was discovered that there was a circulating virus in cats that was a first cousin to HIV, a lentivirus called feline immunodeficiency virus, which caused a disease which was nearly identical to AIDS. It basically caused the uh, uh, wasting diseases, it caused the collapse of the CD4 cell subsets, and it caused immune deficiency and then succumbing to opportunistic infections which were present in the environment that normally a properly functioning immune system would defend against. There was a coronavirus which actually caused outbreaks in, uh, in domestic cats of feline infectious peritonitis, which is the first cousin and a close relative in genetic terms to the virus that caused the SARS outbreak in 2001 in China and killed about a thousand people and shut down the economy over there. There are herpes viruses in cats that are homologous to the herpes viruses we have in humans, giant viruses that cause different kinds of diseases. There's papillomaviruses that are associated with uterine and cervical cancer as the humans have the HPV strains that we now have vaccines for, there's avian flu viruses, there's others and so forth. So there's a lot of viruses, but if we didn't have a genome, we wouldn't have these. So we do have a genome now. They've gone, this is, this is actually feline immunodeficiency virus compared to the, some of the other lentiviruses such as HIV, monkey lentiviruses, bovine, sheep, and horse. So the cat genome became sequenced for the first time about 10 years ago by a cat that volunteered to have her genome sequenced named Cinnamon, who lived in Columbia, Missouri. And here I am obtaining informed consent from Cinnamon to get her blood. Okay, we published a number of papers, we mean in the cat community, uh, where we had light sequencing, then heavier sequencing, then much heavier sequencing a few years ago. This was done at NIH, this was done at NIAAA, and this was done at the Dubjansky Center. And basically right now we have a proper good map like the dogs that can be used for the community. And I will mention that about 15 years ago, with the help of Purina Dog Chow, uh, we are Nestle Purina Company, we set up an annual meeting called Recent Advances in Feline and Canine uh, Genomics, where clinicians from veterinary institutions and geneticists who are interested in the genomic structure get together and communicate every year about ways to make the understanding of these diseases a little better. Now, <clears throat> the first sequence gave us a bunch of features that was similar to what we had on the human, which is basically identifying the 20 or so, 20,000 genes, the, uh, the expressed sequences, the repeats, the pseudogenes for nuclear mitochondrial, endogenous retroviruses, and all these kinds of things which, different, which are found in genomes. Today, 
I will say, we have about 400 whole genome sequences of vertebrate species. The first one was, was, was humans, which came in 2001, and then we had mouse and rat and, uh, <coughs> and a few other model species, and then the next ones were the cats and dogs and uh, horses and, and whales and a few other species, and the cat one has been uh, one that we've been part of for a long time, and I'm excited about it. Uh, there's a bunch of inherited diseases and coat color genes which have quickly been identified according to the gene mutations in each of these. What hasn't been done is identify the specific gene that is associated with domestic nice behavior in cats or in dogs. That hasn't been done. In fact, it hasn't been done in humans either. In humans, there was a candidate, a Fox Pro gene, which Savante Prabo reported a few years ago, which was associated with um, speaking and with, uh, you know, uh, the ability to form words. But it only explained a very small amount of the differences between pre-humans and humans. There is a community now of people who are very interested in finding out what are the genes that cause horses to be domesticated so you can sit on them, but you can't sit on a zebra and ride around or a giraffe or some of those things. And this is with cows, pigs, cats, dogs, all the common species. We just don't know. But we'd like to get together and talk about it and speculate, and every time somebody writes a paper on an inspection of the whole genome, they come up with a few candidates, and then the next guy will do, come up with other candidates and other species. But we'll get there. We're not quite there yet. This is for you guys to do, okay? <laughs> so, in, in, among the coat-colored genes that are interesting is this pattern formation, spots and, and stripes and, and blotches and, and cheetahs and house cats and so forth, and we worked that out to a specific gene uh, which was uh, called uh, KPEP and published this in Science a few years ago. But once you have the genome sequences and you have the materials, finding this stuff is a matter of just getting the training to know how to get to it. And that's what you kids can be doing if you're excited about this sort of thing, because there's plenty more important questions. The easy one, low frying hanging fruits, already fallen off. But the hard ones like domestication and like behavior and like neuroscience, they're just ripe. Okay. Uh, there were ways of sorting out the, same, the cat breeds, which are actually less signal than the dog breeds with these kinds of phylogenetic algorithms. And when you, when you put them together, you could come up with some background. In some cases, there were statistically significant associations with the different groups, with the, either the phylogenetic trees or the structure algorithm. So we kind of know who's related to who in these breeds. And we can kind of test it because, remember, the cat breeds have only been around for less than 130 years or so, dogs much longer. So, today, what's going on is the dogs and the cats have provided medical models. They've been around as medical models for a while, but genomics has really empowered them. We have cancer cohorts of dogs from different institutions throughout the United States collaborating on a lifelong watch at how they do. This is what we do with human populations to try to see. But speeding up the process of cancer in dogs is a terrific opportunity that can tell us a lot about medical applications and, and functions. So all of these are good things, and we're kind of happy. Carlos Driscoll led the project. He's now getting old. He spent most of his time in graduate school. But he's basically a, now a, a, a staff member at the National Institutes of Health, where I started out years ago as well. Uh, <clears throat> he's responsible for publishing the original article in Science, the PNAS article, and the Scientific Mer American article, which is really much of the cat-related inference that I've said today. He's kind of a dreamer, and he's good at getting other people to do his work for him, but he's also really smart. So these are the kinds of people that I have been lucky enough to work with, and I just want to say right now, thank you for your attention and ask for a few questions. <laughs>
You didn't know the first geneticists were 10,000 years old, did you? <laughs> Go ahead. I said a lot of things that were probably uh, controversial, so I know some of you would like to have me defend it because that's what my friends do. They try to get out the ideas. Shall I ask you questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to ask. <laughs> yes, John. That's clearly true. There, the consequences of inbreeding was recognized originally by Charles Darwin, who noticed that <clears throat> domestic animals had congenital abnormalities associated with the fact that they'd been inbred a lot. We all know now that the reason for that is that when you inbreed a lot, you homogenize similar regions and recessive genes that are normally covered by uh, the good form uh, are lost. And that's why you have high degrees of hereditary diseases as well as susceptibility to complex diseases like cancers and diabetes and other diseases in these domestic animals. So by all means, that's exactly what's happening in there. And this is what they try to avoid in endangered species in the zoo community today is to try to maximize outbreeding. But domestic animals don't really get that yet, or at least the breeders. Some of them do. They recognize that it'd be good to produce a dog that uh, is of a particular breed that normally gets these kidney stones or something to basically interbreed them or outbreed them with individuals that don't. So there are better practices going on, but it's, this is an evolutionary lesson. And evolutionary lessons are important in any phase of medicine, all of them, including this one. There's an evolutionary lesson I learned when I was working on HIV and AIDS at the National Institutes of Health. When they kept developing drugs that would be powerful against stopping HIV inhibitors of some of the enzyme, but because HIV produces a billion copies a day in a novelly infect, in, the, in an infected individual, a drug that was put in there would lead to resistance in the viruses because there was a billion of them. So what they did is they said, well, suppose we use two or three drugs, each of which have a 10 to the minus 8 likelihood of <clears throat> developing resistance. Then we predict that the likelihood of developing resistance against all three is 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 8th, which is 10 to the 24th which is a lot more than a billion. And that's why the triple drug therapy today works in HIV patients, is because of that evolutionary inference about the statistics of having three drugs as opposed to one. It's not just obvious, it's, it's robust evolutionary thinking. So that's kind of off your point, but the point is, yes, inbreeding is, is something that we, we need to avoid. And But now that we have, <clears throat> tools and we have veterinary clinicians who have the ability to test for some of these diseases and mutations. It's possible to set up breeding structures which in a few generations eliminates these things, which we couldn't do before. So that's how the genomics is helping the veterinary profession. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and I had meant to put that in there, okay? In the 1950s, there was a guy named Dmitry Belyov in Novosibirsk, Russia, who decided that he wanted to emulate domestication of our forefathers by taking a common fox that lived in the countryside called silver foxes. And he started breeding them to see if he could select artificially for tame behavior versus nasty behavior. And he did it simply by taking the animals who responded to the keepers in a simple test 
that was basically meant to discriminate offspring from a cross. And after 20 or 30, Belov is dead now, but I was just at a conference called the Dmitry Belov Conference in, about fox breeding in Novosibirsk last year. And at that meeting, we got to see Diane and I got to see the foxes, and I held the tame one in my arms, and the tame one scratched me. <laughs> but the point is that the reason that they invited me is because my colleagues and I had gone ahead and attempted a few years earlier the sequencing of 12 animals that were not tame, 12 animals that were tame, and 12 animals that were just running around in the wild. And that whole genome sequence and analysis, which was published earlier this year in Nature, basically discovered one gene that looked to be really important in the discrimination of the selection, one variant, about which affected behavior. There were others that were secondary. We're waiting to see if that's really true or not, but I think that the, that shows you how whole genome sequencing can help. So I'm very excited about the collaborations because the Russians were very prescient in setting up these experiments back in the 50s and 60s. And it's really kind of a sad story, too, because Belyov was a, was a, was a uh, scientist in the laboratory working on genetics in the 50s. And his brother, whose name was, I think, Vladimir, he was the director of the institute when Stalin became in there, and then they developed the um, uh, uh, aversion to genetics in Russia. So his, his brother, who was the director, was arrested and sent off to the gulag where he died. And Dmitri, he kept his mouth shut and just did without raising attention under the, I mean, and, and of course you all heard, how many of you heard of Lysenko? Okay. Students, you never heard of Lysenko? You should know who Lysenko is, Google it, okay? He was the scientist who basically subverted Russian agriculture and Russian development because he hated genetics in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and he was the one who was responsible for Lysenko's brother going off to the gulag. He was a bad, bad scientist who felt that Mendelism and genetics was just a way for Westerners to exploit the fact that some varieties of the species were better than other varieties. He says, nope, communism doesn't accept that. The communism says we're all the same, so he, he liked the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristic. This was his mantra. He was a dope, <laughs> okay? But that's what he said. And I've been in Russia now for six years, and I've enjoyed having conversations with different people about that history and about what, what has happened, and it's fascinating. But to get more of that, you're going to have to read my next book. But you can read about the genome sequence in, uh, in Nature. I, I'll send it to you, okay? Anything else? Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you could comment. You briefly sort of mentioned um, domestication of plants. I did. And so, like, are there similar works to trace back origins of weeds? And there are. There are. And some of my colleagues in the, in the plant genetics community have really done a good job. I mean, the beauty of working in plants genetics is you can really make all the crosses you want without any trouble. You can also clone most plants by taking a single cell and growing it up in an incubator, which you can't do with people, although ask Gearhart, he'll know about that uh, when he comes here. But the truth is that there is a rich literature on domestication of plants and where it came from, which is the reason we are so certain about the Fertile Crescent and the Neolithic Resolution, it's mostly because of the plant science that has come in parallel with it. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's basically, I'm so pleased to read what they say, and, uh, you know, that's good. Yes, yes, ma'am. Are there pluses? Very 
Co founder of Founder Yeah. Yes, of course, it's always possible. The way to think of a founder effect is getting a deal of a 52 card deck, which can be all things. It, most of them are mediocre. Sometimes they're a bust and you go extinct. Sometimes you get four of a kind or a royal flush and then you do better. Everyone is different and the consequences of everyone is different because when you are homogenizing the genomes of a population, remember that the genomes are in the order of 20,000 genes of the order of 10 million DNA variants. And those 10 million DNA variants are all distributed across the population. And when you inbreed in a bottleneck, you might lose half of them, but if you survive at all, and mostly they do, then you got a new shuffled deck you got new ones that are higher in frequency, others that maybe went away that were bad for you. It just depends. Every bottleneck that I've seen in animal populations, I've studied a lot. I've seen it in the cheetahs, I've seen it in Florida panthers, I've seen it in emer leopards, I've seen it in the black-footed ferrets, I've seen it in, um, oh well, recently we've seen it in the Puerto Rican parrot, we've seen it in lots of different species I could go on. And there's a whole field now in conservation genetics which studies it and tries to see what it is in all these species. So, yes, there are examples, you're right, that are good. And yes, you can increase things like language uh, focus by a uh, uh, population founder effect. And there's lots of founder effects. I mean, when, when the Africans came out of Africa, there was clearly a founder effect. We lost two-thirds of the variation in that exercise. When the people founded uh, North America, it was bottlenecks. In fact, even the cats that were brought over to America in the different cities show bottlenecks from the cities they came from in the first place. <laughs> so there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of examples of these. And I don't think bottlenecks are all bad. I mean, when we originally discovered a bottleneck in cheetahs in the 80s, you know, we were, we, were, we were disturbed because we hadn't really thought about that. But then everybody started looking for them and we saw that, well, it doesn't happen every time, but it does happen sometimes. And some of them can be okay. I mean, diploidy and population genetics is a field that has grown a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. So we begin to understand a lot better what it can do about migrations, about assessing medical consequences, about assessing fitness, and about assessing what happens when a population does something like that? You can't always predict it, but you can look at it afterwards and have examples, and that's, that's the best we can do with some of these things. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'm curious about the difference in the genome of the feral population of cats over the last 10,000 years because of the interbreeding of the domestic cats. Of the wildcats or of the domestic cat population? Well, okay, that's what I want to know is about what happened to the wildcats because those do interbreed. Um, I think that a lot of them have um, just simply persisted with it. The wildcat population, the founder population, at least in most of the places that we sampled, there is still relic individuals that do not have any interbreeding and one of the things that we've learned in the last 20 years is looking at different populations and speciation events is that admixture and hybridization between two different kinds is not so unusual. We think we interbred with the Denisovan pre-historic um, people. We think that we that the Europeans and the Chinese interbred with the Neanderthals, and the, we think that when in the formation of a lot of new species that happens, there are, is gene flow uh, between the diverging populations. So what I guess I'm trying to say is that the process is a population-based thing. It's multifaceted, and there is often admixture between it, and um, Sometimes it goes bad. I mean, there's people that think the giant panda is a, is a dead end because it sits out there on the bare lineage further away from everybody else and there are no 
close species relatives and it's very, very specialized for eating bamboo on the top of mountains above the tree line. And if you take away that habitat, you know, pandas don't do as well as the other bears or anything else. And I think that is true for some species. I think outliers can go extinct. But we're just trying to understand the ecology and the biology and using the molecular techniques with non-traditional species like these now. And I think it's a huge opportunity. When I was a student, when you went into genetics, you could work on Neurospora or Drosophila or, or um, yeast or mice. Today, we have genome sequences from 400 mammal species and we've got a lot of others with ecologists and biologists interested in them. So to the whole, you're gonna hear at the end of this course about a gift that, it, that we're trying to give to you people, which is a whole genome sequence for every species that you can catch, every mammal species or vertebrate species. And that's called the Genome 10K Project. And that project has blossomed into an international community that has pulled together to try to gather specimens and sequence and money for providing whole genome sequence on the internet for just about every vertebrate you can think of, which is very cool because it means that you're going to be able to look this up when you find a bird you like or, or a fish you like or a whale or a cetacean or a porpoise or whatever it is. Those are good things. Yes, sure. Uh, We've got five more minutes before the next class comes in. <laughs> and I'd like to leave time for the discussions because I learn stuff. I don't learn anything when I talk. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Since cats um, domesticated along with us and so they're eating our garbage, and we know that many animals are indicators of health status, of, of the environment, things like that. Yes. Have cats, and since they hold similarities in diseases, have they been used as indicators of diseases humans may get later down the road? Well, I think that there are people who study feline pathology and medicine and infectious disease who think they are seeing some prescient things. In fact, there's a lot of angst going on in the model organism veterinary models where they discover things like vaccines for FIV that work and the people that work on human vaccines don't care. You know, as if there are discoveries there's a really good book by a woman at UCL, it just came out a few years ago, called Zubiquity. And it's, she's a medical doctor, and she documents a dozen or 20 different examples of veterinary successes and insights that should be used in human medical stuff, but hasn't. It's slow. Progress is slow. It's like politics. It takes time. <laughs> yes? Can you comment, though, for a disease such as like uh, canine hip dysplasia, where and I know there's obviously not just any effects on all sorts of environmental factors. That sure, sure. It's a complex disease, right. But when you have such variability, both in age to variety of onset, like you know, kids live anywhere from 12 weeks to two years of age. Yes. Is there any genetic basis for that, like seeing the variability in like the presentation, uh, not just in hip dysplasia, but other diseases? I'm going to dodge that question by introducing Joel to you. He's, he's a veterinarian here in Evansburg who is the grandson of Wayne Takas, who was the chairman of biology here for 160 years, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who's sitting next to him. To get back to your question, Joel, uh, there is clearly many important diseases that are complex, even in humans, that we're struggling with in ways to find out what we can do and what the genetic components are. And it's moved from the molecular biology and genetics departments in the medical schools into the schools of public health, where they're collecting the patients and they're collecting the individuals and they're 
good at statistics and they know how to come up with association studies and that's a good thing because these guys were wasting their time before but now they're doing really good stuff with genetic associations in these schools of public health in the veterinary professions i think we're just getting started with a complex disease we have to pay attention and use humans as a model in some cases but to get actually to the genetic determinants requires the considerations of things like what fraction of the variance is explained by this mutation, what fraction of the variance is explained by age, what fraction of the variance. Because if you could quantify from zero to 100 percent what the components of onset of this disease is in a person or in a dog or in a cat, well then you're halfway there because that means you can start then thinking about what are the biggest determinants and which are the, which are the fewest and start developing drugs. Hip dysplasia, You know a field that really has not arrived yet because it hasn't got the right technology? It's developmental biology. I mean, tissue development and things like that. The stem cell impetus is going to help on that a lot, along with genomics. But this is another area which you students who are thinking about a career in scientific research or discovery really will get better. Development, neuroscience, genetics, population statistics programming combine them all together and you say I have to learn all that stuff yes you do <laughs> but when you do you'll be in a position to outpace your superiors really quickly I don't know if I answered your question yeah we should probably wrap up. okay Let's thank Dr. Ryan. yeah Right. This uh, lecture series will be re uh, uh, will begin again. I was thinking we're going to start looking at potentially other rooms if our audience continues to grow. So, uh, and that's that's a very good thing as well. So, uh, thank you once again for coming. Hope to see you again after break. Before you leave, I said last time on Tuesday that I'm going to have office hours at 3:30 to 5 or 3:30 no, to 5 every day. Today, I'm not because I have to travel away, but I will Tuesday a week and every lecture thereafter we'll have, we'll have uh, office hours. And when the visitors come, we're going to have a reception for them because they're important where we can just have a chance for all of you to meet them, okay? Mm -hmm.